Hello and uh, welcome to everyone uh, to this uh, week's uh, special guest lecture um, on the Law of the Sea module. And we are delighted to have with us Ambassador Rolf Heiner Fiefe, uh, who is um, not only, uh, as you will see, um, a great expert and very experienced diplomat and international lawyer, but also a very dear friend uh, um, of both Nilofer and myself, and currently a colleague at the International Law Commission. So I've met uh, Rolf Einer a long time ago when he was legal advisor for Norway, and in that uh, um, capacity, he has participated in a number of uh, meetings, negotiations, and uh, uh, his experience is extremely varied from law of the sea issues, but also to the ICC and any other uh, matters of international law. Um, he's also been ambassador to Paris, uh, recently um, ambassador of Norway to the European Union, um, a post that he's just finished um, very, very recently and returned to Oslo. And of course, now uh, he's our very dear colleague in the International Law Commission. So uh, it is a great pleasure to have you, Rolf. Uh, we're looking forward to learning from you. Um, and as you'll see, um, dear participants, not only from uh, um, somebody who's, who's as an excellent international lawyer, but very experienced, and we will hear from uh, Ambassador Fife on the law of the sea, uh, baselines and sea level rise. Uh, what can they learn from the 1951 ICJ judgment in the fisheries case, which is a, a case that involved Norway and subsequent um, uh, developments. And so on behalf of uh, Nilufer uh, of the E-Academy and myself, a um, uh, big, big um, uh, warm welcome to you, Rolf. And um, the floor is all yours. And thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you so much, uh, Patricia, and thank you, Patricia and Nilufer, for inviting me. I'm very honored by that. And I send you all my best greetings from uh, snowy Oslo, where there are uh, minus 10 degrees centigrade and uh, for the first time, quite a certain amount of snow. So I envy you in Singapore, where I think you have uh, more sunlight and uh, possibly better temperatures right now. I'm very honored to have been invited uh, to speak about uh, baselines and uh, sea level rise. I will uh, try to connect to um, my own experience. I must admit I was not born when this judgment in 1951 was uh, delivered by the International Court of Justice. Uh, it's a key uh, landmark judgment, which uh, should be of interest for anyone dealing with international law and the law of the sea in particular, because it set out for the first time uh, in detail uh, some uh, method with regard to uh, how to uh, draw baselines around uh, uh, rugged coastlines, etc. And uh, baselines, as you know, are key. It's uh, the basis, the starting point for measuring any distances, any extents of maritime zones at sea. It's also at the same time the outer limits of any internal waters. So uh, the judgment in 1951 was, uh, you could call it a turning point in the law of the sea, which provided for uh, uh, the later rules uh, that were developed codified, etc. Now, I was not born in 1951, but 50 years later, in 2001, I was in charge of uh, revising those baselines that had been uh, accepted or recognized by the court in 1951. And uh, I would like at some point during our event to share with you some reflections about the considerations and subsequent developments that have taken place. Um, and they may contribute to shedding some light on this very crucial new focal issue in broad sea, that is sea level rise, consequences for maritime zones, particularly for the most exposed small island developing states. And uh, incidentally, let me uh, salute 
the uh, enormous contributions made, among others, by uh, Nilufer and Patricia, Patricia Nilufer, in the International Law Commission uh, through this, uh, uh, by, by um, co chairing this uh, study group that has issued some guidance on how to actually tackle this issue of sea level rights. And we're going to continue discussing that. So uh, I will not go into what the ILC, the International Law Commission, has been doing. I think uh, Nilufer and Patricia are a better uh, place than uh, myself to, to give you the in-detail um, state of affairs and the background history. But I think I will try to fit into that uh, set of developments some um, uh, experience from uh, the 1951 judgment and later on. Let me say that the 1951 judgment uh, was uh, key to uh, not only understanding when you could draw straight baselines, straight baselines are, you could call them artificial uh, lines connecting the outermost points um, between, uh, it could be um, deep indentation, indentations, as I say, where, where the coast has some profound cleavages uh, including in Norway fjords, or you have a fringe of islands in the immediate vicinity of the coast. It was not only about straight baselines. I think the, the judgment deserves to be reread and revisited because it also has quite a number of uh, observations on the very nature of the process of uh, establishing baselines and uh, their background. So, uh, let me just say that in the current discussions on sea level rise, to give you a flavor or a, 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 a signal as to what has been causing some anxiety uh, in some cases, is what happens if you suddenly or at gradually see the sea level rising with the effect of basically seeing the coastline withdrawing, baselines moving, and possibly leading to chain reactions, to a kind of cascading series of consequences for maritime zones outside or beyond the baselines. And that has included questions as to whether uh, islands might become, uh, have, a, have a smaller land territory uh, and, and possibly have experienced some kind of loss of entitlement, loss of entitlement to economic zones or continental shelf. Now, I, you, you may be familiar with both baselines and sea, lo sea level rise issues, but uh, let me just uh, uh, recommend very strongly before continuing, uh, please have a look at the latest report of the International Law Commission, which has been discussed in the General Assembly of the United Nations this autumn. It has a chapter which is dedicated to exactly this issue of the effect of sea level rise and what the response it could be in international law to promote greater stability, certainty, and basically promote a fair uh, outcome of any considerations relating to the entitlements of uh, uh, small island developing states in particular, but also others. So what I wish to discuss with you is whether there is state practice, and that's where my country, Norway, may come into uh, the uh, fore. Uh, is there any state practice uh, that may uh, and background uh, that may provide evidence of what I've perceived to be quite a common shared vision. That is, we wish to promote stability. We wish to promote legal certainty uh, and permanence. And we already have uh, some very strong basis for asserting that if you have concluded, negotiated agreements on boundaries, there are already very strong uh, uh, rules, you could say, in international law that speak in favor of permanence of such boundaries. Uh, I will now, since we are on Zoom, zoom in on what the key topics, uh, in my view, uh, in my intervention will be. The first one will be to go back to 1951, go back to uh, the situation 
where one didn't have much guidance in international law as to uh, how you could uh, draw baselines and on that basis define what are the internal waters on the landward side of baselines and how you calculate any extent of maritime zones beyond, whether it is the territorial sea and later on economic zones, continental shelf, etc. Let me just mention for you as a few fun facts that baselines were actually, for the first time in history, referred to in a treaty in 1839. That was in a treaty between France and Great Britain, <clears throat> and it concerns waters between uh, the northern coast of France in Normandy and Brittany and the southern coasts of England in particular. What was at the time a key issue was tidal ranges, because in those waters you have enormous differences between high uh, tides and low tides. You have, uh, you may know about the island of Jersey. Uh, if you really want to uh, uh, share fun facts uh, around the dinner table with your friends and others, you can ask them where is the third largest tidal range in the world? Well, it's the island of Jersey. So if you go on the website of the government of Jersey, we, we will discover, as I did some time ago, that the tidal uh, differences are up to 12 meters. And that has the effect of the land territory of Jersey doubling in size. Uh, when you have uh, the maximum range of low water. So that is just to give you an impression of how dynamic differences there may be already in international law. And the, some of the first considerations about baselines had to do from where do you measure uh, the coastline? Is it from uh, the low water line or where is it from? And in the case of France and Britain, of course, uh, uh, this was a key issue in the English Channel, or La Manche, as the French call it. Uh, you may, of course, then wonder if this was the third largest tidal range in the world, what are the first and second ones? The first one is in Canada, it's the Bay of Thunday, and the other one is uh, Bristol Channel of England. Now, none of that has actually been at the forefront in the situation Norway was facing in the 20th century, because we don't have such differences in low water lines or uh, high water or high tide, tide. Nor do we have any atolls. We don't have uh, fringing reefs of the kinds you will find in the Pacific or Indian Oceans or elsewhere. Our situation is very particular, and I leave here aside some places where you have glaciers, so you have ice-covered uh, coast where you may have certain challenges in defining exactly where from you will measure. But uh, I will uh, go now to um, uh, the, the um, I think, uh, first uh, I will ask uh, our uh, assistant, able assistant, Teresa, if you could just first uh, give us a map which shows uh, the Kingdom of Norway and its neighbors. This is just to situate where we are. Um, the, the, you will see those are the economic zones of uh, Norway in darker blue shade. And uh, the 1951 judgment uh, concerned uh, the area related to the mainland of Norway. You see the mainland of Norway is... Uh, um, if you still have the map up, uh, there we are. Uh, the lands, uh, the, the mainland of Norway, uh, the northernmost part of the mainland of Norway uh, is north of the Arctic Circle. It's uh, the north, the Arctic Circle is at six, roughly 66 degrees latitude north. And uh, the area that the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, considered based on an application of the United Kingdom, who disputed the way we drew um, uh, our baselines, concerned um, the uh, area uh, 
that I will refer to in more detail. If you can turn now to uh, the other slide, uh, Teresa, which is uh, basically the county of uh, Finnmark, which is the northernmost county of mainland Norway. It's coming up now. Uh, this area is uh, just to give you uh, the size of it. What you see here is larger than the Benelux countries together. It's larger than Denmark. Uh, so it's very big uh, region. Uh, it has relatively few people, but you will find people in, uh, uh, on many of those islands and many of uh, those uh, along the coast in the innermost parts of those fjords. Now, if you look at what we had uh, done since uh, mid 19th, uh, 18th, uh, 19th century, was to basically, uh, it was a long standing Norwegian practice to say we cannot measure the baseline where from we measure the extent of the territorial sea. We cannot just follow the coastline technically, entering every fjord that is. You will see this is a large scale map. Uh, remember, it's as large as the Belgium, the territory of Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg put together, larger than that. So, if you, if you sort of zoom in into a different scale, you will find there are many more um, curvatures, uh, fjords, uh, many more islands than those you see here. But uh, what you will uh, see that there is some sense in uh, simplifying the baseline and drawing it from the outermost points, connecting the mouths of certain fjords uh, and uh, connecting the islands. So if you look at the easternmost part of this map, uh, you have the land boundary with, the, with Russia, with the Russian Federation, which is our easternmost neighbor. And uh, after, uh, west of that, you have Finland, but uh, we, we are here, concerned about the, the sea limits and the baselines. So what we had done was to basically draw baselines and you see the, um, uh, the, the there is, if you start from the Russian border, uh, the, the point which is at the end of the land boundary, you see a stipled line going over to a place called Varde on the peninsula in, uh, in the east of Finnmark. And then you will see it continuing along the outermost points all the way down. Now, uh, the, you, the well, Great Britain uh, claimed that that would entail two large internal waters. This was uh, a very bad precedent if it were to be applied by other states in other contexts. So the discussion was actually, uh, interestingly enough, about this area north of the Arctic Circle. And uh, let me also hasten to add that compared to, if you look at this latitude, those high latitudes, north of 66 degrees latitude north, this is one of the few places, at least at the time, now we have less ice than before uh, because of climate change around the world, but uh, we have ice-free coasts because of the Gulf Stream coming from the Gulf of Mexico. Please take that into consideration. At the same latitudes in northern Siberia, in Greenland, northern Canada, you will have icy conditions, which would also have led to much less human and economic activity. While the characteristics of this area are ice-free coasts, huge mountainous areas behind. So what would connect the people were the shared maritime uh, possibilities of connecting across fjords and between islands. And fishing was a key and still is a key activity. Now, interestingly enough, if you are following this now from a more sort of methodic approach of using the Law of the Sea Convention, this fantastic convention, which provides the overall framework and where Tommy Coe of Singapore played a key role at key stages of the negotiations. A fantastic document which has shown its continued relevance for um, peace and security and a number of other values we put up uh, on top of our lists. 
If you look at Article 7 of the Convention, it speaks of two different criteria which may uh, basically make it possible to draw straight baselines. Uh, one of the criteria they call the fringe of islands along the coast in its immediate vicinity. That is, according to the 1951 judgment, of the International Court of Justice, this is what characterizes the western part of this map. So if you, if you start from the left, outside uh, uh, you see the city of Trumse, you see many islands, but if you zoom in and you take a drone and go down close to sea levels, you will find ever more islands, islets, skerries, and quite uh, an enormous number of, of uh, bits of territory. Uh, and more people living around those than actually uh, inland in some cases, because uh, inland you're separated by deep valleys, high mountains. Now, if you follow those small islands, this fringe of light islands in the immediate vicinity, and you move northwards, you see uh, close to the top of uh, the map, you have a place called Harveysjön and Honningsvåg. At the end of the road there, you, you have North Cape, North Cape that many tourists wish to visit because this is the northernmost point on the European continent, uh, mainland based because there are islands north of this, of course. But the area from the far left of this map to North Cape, this is the area that the International Court of Justice defined as the fringe of islands along the coast in its immediate vicinity and refer to this terrible Norwegian word or Scandinavian word of Skjærgård, S-K-J-A-E-R-G-A-A-R-D, Skjærgård. I've been asked often by foreign international lawyers, what on earth does Skjærgård mean? It means in Norwegian, a rock rampart. Why is that? It is because if you come with a boat or a ship, from uh, the high seas and you come close to this area, you will just see one mass of mountains, a, a rampart, like a fortress of rocks. And it's absolutely uh, impossible to distinguish uh, what are islets, islands or mainland. They are totally integrated. They're visible from far off. I think the geographic description provided for in the judgment on page 127 is exceedingly interesting. It's not lengthy, but it provides some clues as to what at the time was meant as a fringe of islands along the coast in its immediate vicinity. So this is, you could say, option one for straight baselines and has been retained in uh, with very small variations in the actual wording of what was codified in 1958 convention, the Nijino Convention on Territorial Sea, etc., and later on, Article 7 of the Law of the Sea Convention. What the court said in this context with the countless waterways within these islands, that is on the western or the left part of this map, is that the coast of the mainland in this area does not constitute, as it does in practically all other countries, a clear dividing line between land and sea. What matters, what really constitutes the Norwegian coastline is the outer line of the, and this terrible word, Skjærgård. So, uh, east of North Cape, the right-hand side of this map, you don't have the Skjærgård. Uh, you can already get an idea of the fact that there are many fewer islands in the eastern part of this map. This is rather the area which the judgment and later on the Law of the Sea Convention refers to as a coastline deeply indented and cut into. So east of North Cape, to quote the judgment, the Skjærgård ends but the coastline continues to be broken by large and deeply indented fjords. You see just in the middle of the map, you have a lengthy 
fjord going down from North Cape. It's called the Porsanger Fjord. Anger, the last part of that name, means actually fjord in Old Norse. So you have the Varanger Fjord, which is uh, to the east. You have Porsanger Fjord, etc. You have, of course, Laxe Fjord, which is the next fjord. Lux means salmon. And um, Varanger Fjord, Var, means fishing village. So you see Kirkenes, the Russian border, but Svarde, that long fjord arm going from east to west horizontally, cutting deep into Norwegian mainland. Var, Anger. Anger means fjord. Fjord, Var means fishing village. So it's the fishing village fjord. So even the names of those places up there refer to a connection between people, fisheries, and the particular geography of this area. Now, I will not go much further into the description of what Norway experienced then, but what is interesting is what the court extrapolated from the consideration that Norway had applied this system consist consistently over time. And um, there is lots there about a consistent practice, state practice that had not been opposed by anyone. But what the court said is that what we do here is actually not to do judicial legislating or creating new law. And there's been a huge debate about that later on. Did the court actually invent something that did not exist to start with? No. What the court actually says is that we see in the Norwegian system for this particular area, quote, the application of general international law to a specific case. And uh, they add, the real question raised in the choice of baselines is in effect whether certain sea areas lying within these lines are sufficiently linked to the land domain to be subject to the regime of internal waters. So, this is on page 133, the court finds itself obliged to decide not whether you should apply the low water mark. Yes, you have to do that. It's the low water mark, but which one? And it, they say it's the relevant low water mark is that of the mainland or of the Shargord. And since the Shargord in this case constitutes a whole with the mainland, it is the outer line of the Shargord which must be taken into account in delimiting the belt of Norwegian territorial waters. So the solution is dictated by geographic realities. Now, what happened here was assimilation. That's the kind of concept I would personally use. Assimilation between a fringe of islands and uh, particular fjord areas with the mainland. It is a kind of extension of the mainland. And it's a notion of dovetailing that has been used by the UN Secretariat. They have issued very good guidance in, I don't know if it's easy to read or not, probably not, but you have this blue series of booklets issued by the Division of Ocean Affairs and Law of the Sea, which is used by many, many coastal states around the world. And they have one about baselines. The notion they use is dovetailing. That is, what is dovetailing? If you see the bird, the dove, the, the tail of the dove connects very precisely in a very strong way with the rest of the body of the dove. And they fit in with each other seamlessly. That was the case here. The court says, and here it goes slightly beyond the Norwegian particular geographic reality. It says, setting baselines is necessarily a unilateral act because it's only a coastal state can do that. But the validity of doing this is of course dependent on international law. So certain principles are uh, necessary to make it possible to judge as to the validity of under international law. They refer in this particular case to, to three uh, criteria that is appreciable extent, uh, should not depart to appreciable extent from the general direction of the coast, should be sufficiently close to land, constitute internal waters, and we should take into account certain economic interests. 
Now, I will not go further down that road, but say that there's been a huge debate later on as to how baselines have actually been drawn, drawing upon the Article 7 of the Law of the Sea Convention. Now I jump over to what may be more um, uh, familiar to many, and that is that we, 50 years after the judgment, uh, what happened between 1951 and 2001, on the basis of the baselines that have been accepted by the International Court of Justice, Norway concluded a number of uh, uh, arrangements, settled boundary issues at sea, using, you could say, the whole toolbox of international law. Negotiations for a territorial sea or economic zones or continental shelf. We used conciliation in a case in 1981 with Iceland. We used arbitration and we used the International Court of Justice in uh, 1993 with an important judgment. Now, all of those were based on the baselines we had ascertained in 1951 were valid. But what we discovered after a few years was that new geodetic methods, that is ways of calculating the surface of the earth, which is something which changes in light of a number of factors, including magnetism, etc., cetera, uh, required more precision. Uh, there was also the question as to whether the measurements, the surveying we had conducted way back, going back to before 1900, were precise enough. And we discovered, oh, there's a huge difference between the, the location of the formal baselines and the actual location of the coastline. So we decided to revise the whole thing. I was in charge of that. And we worked a couple of years considering this area before you and all the other areas of the Kingdom of Norway. And we found out that we could re revise those, adopt new baselines, without that having any negative effect, any impact whatsoever on any of the maritime boundaries that we had set out and established based on agreement with neighboring states or other uh, processes. I think it's quite interesting to note that when we communicated what we were doing in revising our baselines with our respective neighboring states, no one had any objection or, or view as to whether we could do this. It was absolutely normal to do such things. We could adapt baselines. And at no point was the issue raised as to whether this would lead to renegotiating anything that had been adapted or adopted. Now, this has a bearing, I believe, on the issue as to whether states that today are facing the pr perspective of seeing sea level rise uh, destabilizing baselines or uh, the uh, coastlines, whether uh, there is a, uh, an impact on the outer limits or negotiated uh, boundaries they may have concluded with regard to, in particular, economic zones or continental shelves. And those two are in particular important economically for those states that are facing such challenges. Because economic zones may provide for possibilities of regulating fisheries, providing quotas for fish, etc. Uh, continental shelf may provide possibilities nowadays also for putting up some installations for, for instance, windcraft, not only hydrocarbon or other activities. All of this goes to bolster the argument that the Vienna Convention of Law Treaties, Article 62, in my view, has, uh, is applicable in terms of uh, uh, when it says that unforeseen change in circumstances will not affect boundary agreements or agreed boundaries, to use my own words. I think we can see ample evidence from our state practice that that is true for maritime boundaries. I could add to this that we have seen other changes. If you go to the 1993 judgment, if you may, Teresa, go over to the other slide, uh, you will see uh, with regard to other parts of the Kingdom of Norway, you have 
the island of Jan Mayen, which is in the mid-Atlantic. It's coming up now, I think. If you have a frontier slide, uh, Teresa. There we are, it's coming around. Uh, you will see, and I was involved in that case in the team before uh, arguing before or pleading before the International Court of Justice from 1990 to 1993, roughly. You see uh, the dark shaded blue, it's not, well, it's less blurred now, but you see an island which is just east of Greenland and north of Iceland. It's Jan Mayen. It's, uh, it looks as though it's a small island, but I think it's in the order of uh, a magnitude or size as Malta. Uh, much fewer people live there, but it's, uh, it's a sizable island in, a, in a, 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 actually. Well, the court in 1993 uh, decided on the boundary line, the delimitation line for the continental shelf and the zones between the island of Jan Mayen and Greenland. And in the northern part of that delimitation line, they, they took into consideration ice conditions at the time, saying that the ice conditions were such that they were a, an impediment for certain fishing activities, and therefore the line needed to be adjusted accordingly. Now, it's not that long ago. 1993 is, of course, in the last or the previous century or millennium. But I would say, in, if you take the long uh, view of history, it's not a lengthy period of time. And I would say today, those areas are now ice-free. Has that change of circumstances, physical circumstances, which was one of the considerations or circumstances that the court took into account when deciding on the delimitation to be uh, adopted, and later on uh, included, the, the line was included in 1993, later on that year, uh, I was a participant in drafting of the agreement with Denmark, Greenland. We, we, we transposed the outcome of that judgment into an agreement between the Kingdom of Denmark and Greenland on the one hand and Norway on the other. And the dis disappearance of ice or the changes in ice conditions have in no way ever raised the issue as to whether one should sort of reopen that, that boundary. I think if you move on to uh, Article 76, Paragraph 9 of the uh, Law of the Sea Convention, you will see pretty strong, a strong basis, which the International Law Commission has also alluded to, for saying that when the Convention states that the outer limits of the continental shelf, particularly in the context of uh, uh, areas beyond 200 nautical miles, which have to be considered by the Commission on the Outer Limits of the Continental Shelf, when they have issued their uh, recommendations and one has registered or deposited with the Secretary General of the United Nations, and please note, with the Secretary General uh, of the uh, International Seabed Authority, if you connect that to another article of the Convention, I think it's 85, you, you have a pretty strong basis for saying and, or quoting from the uh, Law of the Sea Convention that the outer limits so deposited or registered are final and binding. So that makes, I think, part of the operationalization, sorry for my slips of the tongue here, it's a difficult word, but when thinking of steps to be taken later on in the wake of the excellent report that was issued by the International Law Commission, on what should states actually do? Could they draw on past experience and state practice? Is it useful to register and deposit outer limits? Uh, I think the answer is yes. There are ways of doing that. Uh, in, in the case of economic zones and continental shelves, I think it's even possible to argue independently of the original baselines and basically consider the baselines as being scaffolding when you do construction and building work. S uh, scaffolds are very important to start with, but then you may remove them for certain considerations. I think uh, without going too far down that road, there is a basis for considering the uh, stability and permanence of outer limits on that account. Referring to the subsequent developments I have alluded to, I could make it much longer, but and there are many other considerations relating to Norwegian state practice. 
but let me also mention that on this map, we do not have uh, another island, which is in the South Atlantic, outside of the scope of application of the Antarctic Treaty. It's the island of Bouvet, where Norway has deposited with the Secretary of the, Uni of the United Nations a series of coordinates representing the limits of the territorial sea. And in so doing, applied Article 16 of the Law of Sea Convention and uh, done so in a sense uh, without making the outer limits of the territorial sea totally dependent on the baselines of uh, or the base points of the island. An island where, by the way, uh, there are certain icy conditions which are not necessarily easy to, to, to manage all the time. So there is scope here, and I would like to salute what also Singapore has been doing with the IHO, the International Hydrographic Organization. I think there's lots that have to be taken into consideration in terms of uh, considering that modern navigation relies more and more on electronic maps. So uh, I would basically think that at some point we will achieve a degree of stability, permanence of uh, uh, maritime zones uh, entitlements of states that are affected by sea level rise. Uh, but we will have a discussion also as to whether um, baselines at the end of the day for certain purposes are, are still the pivot or the only basis for uh, the consideration of the validity of legal entitlements to use very formal language. So please consider uh, a number of provisions of the uh, Law of the Convention as being helpful. There are at least uh, four which have to do with uh, registering uh, with the uh, Secretary General of the UN or, uh, and or the Secretary General of the International Seabed Authority, uh, the limits or uh, register the uh, coordinates for boundaries. Uh, I think that provides for uh, stability. I know that a number of small island states in the Pacific Ocean have been doing tremendous advances, very good work in uh, carrying out that work. I think the IHO has also a very important role to play. I know Singapore is well placed and your own uh, environment, academic environment, Nilo uh, Ferreira Patricia is excellent uh, in terms of fostering uh, cross regional support. I will end by saying that uh, I'm struck by the fact that there are quite a few provisions in the part of the convention which deals with uh, uh, cooperation for uh, uh, in terms of mar marine technology and other uh, issues. I note that Article 275, Paragraph 1, speaks of national centers to enhance developing coastal states' national capabilities to utilize, and now I quote, and preserve their marine resources for their economic benefit, unquote. So that is also an example of the objective set out by the convention in promoting this. If you connect that to other parts of the convention which speak of regional uh, approaches to this and the role of competent international organizations, there is ample opportunity to work together to help those who are most affected by that. So I hope this lengthy uh, uh, expose from my side has not led you falling entirely asleep. Uh, I find the, the discussion concerning the Norwegian case of baselines to be um, quite uh, uh, close to my own heart. But of course, there are other issues of baselines around the world. But I think there is a very strong basis for recognizing that the degree of liberty afforded to coastal states when dealing with baselines and recognized by the court in 1951 is also applicable for new challenges nowadays and in the future. Thank you so much. And uh, please do not uh, consider my, the length of my statement as a, as a strategy to uh, prevent any questions. Uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rolf. And, um, and, and uh, as I told them, um, the participants, uh, they would uh, uh, certainly be impressed by um, your in-depth knowledge, not only of international law, but of practice and the practice of your own country and your own personal involvement, not in the 1951 judgment, as you stressed, but uh, but certainly in the, 
developments um, afterwards. And, and I think it's also, I would say, but then I would pass on to Nilofer, who might have uh, also a, a comment before we wait for questions um, uh, to be asked both in the chat or the Q&A or live questions, because for the moment, I don't see any requests, but I'm sure they will come. Um, but, I, but I think that it's, um, it, it's, it's also what you've presented as it's a very important example on how to look to state practice, even if it's in different areas or not immediately obvious, for example, for the issue of sea level rise, but state practice um, that helps us identifying the applicable principles even to new situations. And I think that's uh, extremely uh, relevant um, also to the work that we do in the in the commission. But please, Nilfer, over to you, because uh, while I monitor the chat and the Q&A, um, maybe you want to add something too. Yeah, I definitely do. Um, that was absolutely a fantastic lecture. I learned a lot uh, from you. Um, that case, of course, we, those of us who love the sea, of course, we know that case. But I think um, the way you explained it, um, and first of all, now I know how to say Scott Yard. <laughs> 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 now I think I did. I was not successful still. <laughs> uh, but, Shy boy. <laughs> but, Shy boy. <laughs> but I think a uh, few people can give that, you know, that um, uh, granular but enlightening uh, overview of that case, actually, which is such a, it is such a seminal case. It's a landmark case, very important. Um, but I agree with uh, Patricia, then linking it now to uh, the 2001. And I have to say, I was very interested in what you said about the, um, the resurveying of the uh, Norwegian coast and how the ice has melted. Um, but I have one question uh, because you said that it didn't change anything. If you could explain that, uh, what you mean by it didn't change anything because I wasn't quite clear on how it is that, you know, the ice had melted there. You had to change something, but not everything changed. So that would be my question, but again, um, and also looking at the Yan Mayan case, really interesting. Um, so I have to say that we are really lucky to have someone with your practical, but also you know very deep understanding of law of the sea um, issues on delimitation. It's a technical area, and I'm not gifted in that at all. I can tell you. <laughs> Thank you so much, both Patricia and uh, Nilufer, and uh, Nilufer for your precise question. I think it's uh, a very, very good question. Uh, and uh, I, I um, would like to sort of um, be even more precise. Uh, consider that the, um, the um, uh, baselines that were considered by the court in 1951, uh, we relied upon them when we negotiated in 1957 a uh, delimitation with uh, the Soviet Union outside the Varanga Fjord for the territorial waters. So we relied on those baselines. So in 2001, we slightly adapted, changed uh, the coordinates based on new surveying and more precise calculation of those base points which were also at, had been relevant at the time in 1957, that did not lead to any changes in the agreement we had with the Soviet Union on the territorial waters. In 1965, we concluded a relatively famous median line or equidistance line um, uh, delimitation for the continental shelf with the United Kingdom. Uh, 1965 and we did the same year uh, uh, the same with Denmark in the North Sea and those two uh, boundary lines which build on equidistance uh, based on the former uh, measurements uh, have uh, remained in place even though we have adjusted uh, uh, modernized the system of baselines along the uh, coastline of southern Norway uh, I could add to this several other agreements, but that would become very boring because we had the 19, um, uh, we have agreements with Denmark, the Faroe Islands, 
and we have uh, had uh, some uh, we have some other agreements. So my my key point there is that when you have negotiated an agreement on boundaries and you have set out precise coordinates for the boundary line, for the delimitation line, then you have established a system which has a life of its own. And if you afterwards have changes in the coastline, uh, that has not that is not an unforeseen circumstance or anything which would lead to uh, changing the boundary line. If, if that were to be the case, the world would look very, very strange. Uh, consider that in between Finland and Sweden, at the very northernmost end of the Botnia um, uh, Sea, you know, the Baltic Sea up to the northernmost part, you have land uh, moving upwards, elevation of land regularly, which leads to recalculation of baselines every, I don't know, 10 years or so, because things are moving slowly, but still uh, quickly if you look at geological time. Um, it would be very strange if there had been uh, an agreement uh, between, and there was an agreement between uh, Finland and Sweden. I, I can't imagine, because I haven't discussed this with them, but I would be surprised if such phenomena would lead to uh, 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 changes in agreed uh, delimitation lines. The other example you refer to, Nilufer, has to do with the Yamain Greenland situation because uh, the court drew a provisional median line, adjusted the median line in light of the disparity in the coastal lengths of Yamain compared to the lengthy coast of Greenland. Mm -hmm. So the provisionally drawn equidistance line was moved slightly. But in the northern part of that delimitation line, the line was actually uh, 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 this moved a, a little further to reflect the uh, continued presence of ice, which made uh, which had an impact at that time, or had been having an effect on fisheries because it had limited the access of trawlers or shrimp trawlers or whatever. Capelin, I think, was the fish used. Um, so uh, what is interesting is that uh, you don't have those impediments anymore for that kind of fishing, as far as I know. And no one has ever, and Norway would never uh, sort of say, uh, call into question the validity of the agreement concluded on the basis of the ICJ judgment in 1993. So uh, if you add to this the fact that you have in certain areas uh, also of Greenland, glaciers that are uh, unfortunately uh, melting or changing shape very, very quickly, uh, you may have uh, 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 a number of situations, but I think that could be the case several places around the world, maybe in the southern hemisphere uh, also, where you will have uh, an accelerated effect of changes in the coastlines uh, configuration. It could have to do with erosion, could have to do with the melting of ice, could have to do with a number of issues. Uh, you could have rivers becoming unfrozen and leading to more sediments building up. Uh, that could, of course, affect the coastline more rapidly than otherwise. But that doesn't mean that boundary treaties uh, that have been negotiated or outer limits of the continental shelf that would have been finalized according to the procedures of Article 76, that those would suddenly uh, have to be reopened. Because that's not an unforeseen uh, circumstance, in my view, that could uh, legitimize or justify such changes. Now, an interesting question operationally is, can you register with the Secretary General of the United Nations the outer limits of the continental shelf if the shelf does not go beyond 200 miles and it's just limited to 200 miles? In my view, there is nothing in the Law of the Sea Convention that uh, prohibits uh, the deposit of data concerning the outer limits of the continental shelf, even though one has not. Uh, submitted to the Continental Shelf Commission because one has an extension of the shelf going beyond 200 nautical miles. So that is something very practical. Would the Secretary of the United Nations, with the International Seabed Authority, with the international community, react negatively to registering, depositing uh, coordinates, which will sort of fix a clear idea of the extent of the Continental Shelf? Also in cases 
where the shelf does not go beyond to a nautical mice, I think it's something to be explored. It's something for future conversations. Yeah, thank you so much. I think it's really important because, um, again, one of the reasons I also ask is that you, the, uh, I, of course, I fully agree that uh, fundamental change of circumstances and that I think in the commission, and, and, and thank you for speaking so well of the work of the study group, that's all of us. Um, I think we pretty well agreed that fundamental change of circumstances would not apply to sea level rise. But one of the issues that arose, the arguments that had been made, well, um, if you allow that, then it's a legal fiction because now you're going to have a very large internal waters that's going to exceed the 12 nautical mile maximum. So was that the case when you resurvey in terms of the reality of the changes that took place with um, the resurvey or the ice melting? Was there a significant difference? Um, so, so that's it's just a, a question I have to follow up because I don't think we have other questions. Um, that, there's one in the Q and A. Oh, there is. Oh, Rolf, okay. Yeah, please, okay. Rolf, go ahead and answer Nulufer, and then the, we go to the Q and A. Um, okay, very good question. Right. Well, well, very briefly put, Nulufer, in the case of Jan Mayen Green, and I think the the adjustment of the delimitation line because of the ice conditions is is uh, significant, quite significant. In the case of uh, the recalculation of the baselines around mainland Norway, uh, they are in the order in some cases of uh, several hundred meters um, because uh, the surveying was extremely old and um, modernization was 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 uh, was useful. So uh, I think uh, you, the question you raise is more uh, acute and valid when it comes to territorial waters in the sense of uh, looking at the territorial sea and internal waters, where the full um, impact of territorial sovereignty uh, comes into play, uh, the issue of overflights, navigation, and also the fact that to calculate the extent of much smaller um, uh, breadth of uh, territorial sea compared to uh, economic zones, you need many more base points to cal calculate that. While if you use uh, arcs of circle of 200 nautical miles for the extent of the economic zone, you need very much fewer base points. So I think um, uh, I would basically say that with regard to economic zones and continental shelf, which are a primary economic concrete importance to the most vulnerable coastal states, I think it's possible to distinguish the cases, unbundle them, so to speak, and say that without prejudice to what this discussion with regard to territorial sea and internal waters, uh, there is clarity as to the continued existence of uh, economic zones and continental shelves. That would be, I simplify it to the extreme, but would say no. you, you, you don't need to have a clarity as to what the state of territorial waters are necessarily. Because I would warn against the, or caution against the, what has been the, uh, custom and understandably so in the history of, of the law of the sea to start from land and build on baselines and let everything depend on baselines. But I think here we can start from the, not from the point of starting point, but from the end point of having established with the international community clarity as to the outer limits and boundaries, which have ergonomous effects of different kinds. So right. um, I think there may be a uh, scope for not letting uh, difficult questions may be in certain cases, yes, uh, in certain cases concerning internal waters, etc. Uh, hold hostage, if I may okay. say so, uh, the issue of uh, continued entitlement with regard to such important economic rights. Excellent. Thank you. So we, we have one question in the Q&A box from Geraldine from France. Um, which is probably more about the, you know, how sustainable this will be in the future in terms of uh, keeping the, the the current situation in terms of the uh, baseline. So it's about permafrost. Some lands are going to disappear as the ice melt with climate change and ice sheet cover reduce. Then the baseline will be different and sea level rise will definitely reduce this land configuration that will subside. The baselines will then be based on land that do not does not exist anymore in future. I understand the fixed agreement on the boundary lines, past surveys and frozen baseline concept, but will this be sustainable in 50 years as we want to protect more high sea, 
ICES areas. Do you think countries will be open to review the negotiated coastlines, baselines in future to adapt to new environments? So I guess it's about the sustainability in the future of uh, these solutions. Well, well, thank you to to the 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 question the question the person put forward this question. Uh, I I would briefly say that uh, the uh, as we saw in the 1951 judgment, the court uh, I, to me it seemed as though the court liked the idea of not uh, extrapolating too much, but they wanted to find a solution to the particular concrete case of the Norwegian rugged coastline, etc. And uh, the way they express themselves, they say individual coastal states are the ones who are better placed to really understand the geography, the physical aspects, the human economic aspects, etc. So there is an issue of international validity coming into play. And uh, to the, the question, I would say, uh, for the time being, uh, you know, it's difficult to predict things, particularly predict the future is very difficult. But I think there is a scope for the international community to rally behind an approach that will be uh, sympathetic to the crucial needs of the most vulnerable coastal states, which are small island developing states and a few others, in order to at least prevent the disappearance or dislocation of um, uh, very important zones of uh, jurisdiction. If that were to happen, I think it would be detrimental also to international cooperation for uh, uh, protection of biodiversity, uh, straddling stocks, uh, fisheries, because you can imagine that nature doesn't like the vacuum. And I think it would be totally contrary to a number of conventions to imagine that uh, because of some changes in coastline, uh, well, uh, the disappearance of uh, national zones of responsibility uh, would would be uh, the, the, the well would would result from from that. So when it comes to making general rules, one should be very very cautious about that. But I think the scope for uh, uh, proceeding a little on the basis of the experience I refer to. And, uh, and uh, apply due caution. I would also say that it's important not to have a situation where everything becomes a virtual uh, uh, depiction of what, how the world looks like. Uh, in our case, why did we change the baselines? Well, because we saw how electronic maps, digital maps are being used by all kinds of users of the seas. And um, uh, there are issues of safety down the road and uh, safety of life at sea. And uh, if you have tremendously choppy waters like those we have, and currently we are facing a winter in Norway where in those areas described, it's pitch dark during winter. It's total darkness. There's midnight sun during summer, but it's pitch dark during winter with very strong winds and where the, the whole issue of the rampart of stone or rocks, the shag or protects from the ocean. So communications can take place within those islands. I think it's uh, it's important to 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 take into consideration uh, the the possibility that one does not wish to have totally artificial uh, coordinates uh, floating around at some point. That's where I think the IHO, the International Hydrographic Organization, of course has a role to play because what will promote consensus is to have different disciplines converging around the same understanding of things. But if we want to solve everything at once through new rules, I think we would jeopardize some of the enormous values uh, relating to peace and security and other things that the Law of Convention ensures. So I would basically favor myself a step-by-step -step approach, which is uh, based on as much empathy and support by the international community as possible to the way particularly small island developing states respond to those challenges. And the way other states respond to this response is going to be quite important for the development of international law. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. Unmute yourself, Patricia. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Rolf. I think we've been... Uh, we We've gone a little bit over time, but we started a little bit late. But so since there are no more questions, I think it's time for us to give you a virtual round of uh, applause. 
Um, and, and again, um, uh, on behalf of the participants in the Academy, to thank you for your precious time and uh, all um, your willingness to share your experience and your reflections um, on, on this matter that is, uh, of course, quite technical, uh, but extremely uh, important um, uh, in face of new um, uh, challenges. Um, but also, I think, with the ultimate goal of uh, uh, promoting what it's now become the mantra of uh, certainty, stability and predictability um, also in these matters that are certainly, as you just said, uh, crucial um, also from for the point of view of peace and security. And so I think that has to be highlighted also. So I give it back to you, Nil, for perhaps for some yeah. final words um, and a big thanks from your yeah. part. Yeah, I, I absolutely echo Patricia. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, you're you know, a working ambassador, you're busy. But can I say, that was really a fantastic lecture. I truly benefited from it. And, and I hope we can uh, impose, continue to impose on your knowledge in the future as well, um, because I think there's a lot more we can continue on these issues. Uh, this is just scratching the surface, but a good start. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you to all of you and uh, best greetings from Oslo to Singapore and wherever you are in the world.